Our scripture this morning comes from Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. having a hard time this morning. Um, It's such an honor and a privilege to listen to you share the gift that God has given to you so that we can be humbled by your gift and we appreciate what you do because we cannot do that and it is very humbling so thank you. Somebody's already asked me, well, why are you preaching on Revelation? And others have asked, why did it take you so long to (laughs) preach on Revelation? So the whole history behind preaching on Revelation is not to scare people into the kingdom, but it is to share the word of God with those who have ears and want to hear. So when you look at the city of Smyrna, you have to think in terms of who was there and why they needed this message. So think of it as once upon a time, there was a little group of Christian folk who were so broke that the only thing that they could pay was attention. (laughs) It was not just that they had no money for anything but the basic necessities of life. They literally had no money whatsoever. They ate scraps that were thrown out into the gutter. They were quite literally reduced to begging to keep body and soul together. They were what we might call street people of the day. The shame of their plight was that just as those who find themselves in the situation in our country and around the world, they were surrounded by plenty but could not touch any of it. The time was about a hundred years after the birth of Christ. The place was Smyrna, one of the richest cities in Asia Minor. Smyrna was an old city. It had been founded over a thousand years before Jesus walked on this earth as a Greek colony and eventually grew to be quite a city. But about 600 years before Jesus, During the Old Testament prophets, the city was destroyed by war and lay waste for 300 more years. And finally, it was rebuilt 300 years before Jesus, according to the design of Alexander the Great. One of the few cities planned in the world back then. The streets were laid out in rectangular blocks and they were known for their incredible example of paving. 
Leave it to the Greeks. It had a large stadium. Of course, it wasn't a football stadium, but it maybe looked like one. But it was for Greek games and other things, and a magnificent library, and one of the largest theaters in Asia Minor, and a host of temples to different particular gods. Greek at the time, later changed to Roman. The people of Smyrna took pride in their hometown. In fact, they were more than a little conceited about their hometown. Smyrna was a great trading city, a fun place to be on a weekend. It's where everybody went to. Alexander's thought-provoking plans had made it convenient for shipping. It had a large outer harbor for mooring and great ships and an exceedingly safe harbor, an inner harbor, much smaller than, and it was surrounded by three sides of land. The inner harbor could be closed by extending a chain across the mouth in time of war. Smart people. Sailors loved it because there was a constant west wind. Unfortunately, they made one mistake. The city's sewage drained into the gulf on which Smyrna stood, and the breeze tended to blow back the odor to the city rather than out to the sea. So the Greeks didn't quite know everything. Well, you know, nothing's perfect. I felt like when I read the history of Smyrna, oh, they must have had a committee that planned that one. <laughs> Despite that, Smyrna was universally regarded as a wonderful place to go. It was called the Crown of Asia, so everybody wanted to go there. It was not that different from Ephesus, which was just 35 miles down the coast. Smyrna was also a free city. It had the privilege of self-government within its bounds. The Greek and Roman Empire never did worry about Smyrna because they were faithful. And they had been loyal to Rome long before the Caesars had conquered everything in their sight. Smyrna had been the first city in Asia to erect a temple to the goddess Roma about 200 years before Jesus. And Cicero, you may remember him from history, the great lawyer politician in the Roman Empire said about Smyrna, Smyrna is the city of the most faithful and most ancient allies of Rome. Well, that worked for a while. Smyrna was home not only to the poorest of the poor, but also to the most numerous and influential Jewish community there ever was in Asia Minor. The Jewish people took as much pride in their town as anyone did. And they had contributed large sums of money to the city for various beautification projects. But as was often the case, the Jewish people of Smyrna were particularly antagonistic to a small group of people who by now were called Christians. They apparently were very jealous of the Christians. And the odd thing is that Christians in Smyrna had no influence to compare with the Jewish people. As a matter of fact, the Christians were like street people. They had nothing. They didn't even have their next meal, not the next meal tomorrow, but the m next meal today. And even though they proved to be a problem for people, life was hard for them. And every Sunday morning, they gathered this little band of Christians early for worship. Don't you know that they enjoyed the quiet fellowship and prayer time and sang low so nobody would hear them. They would regularly reflect on the words of comfort such as found in the Psalms. King David once said in Psalm 37, the wicked draw the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and needy 
to kill those who walk uprightly. Their swords shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. Those are the kinds of words from the Psalms that they must have read to one another, to encourage one another, to be faithful, regardless of the way they were treated in the town. For folks who live their lives on the edge of desperation, these words to them might seem like the best food and drink in the country. It was the only thing they had to turn to. And then on one Sunday morning, the pastor continued reading to them by telling them that they had a letter from their church leader, John, who had been sent to the Isle of Patmos to be in prison camp for his outspoken opposition to the Roman emperor, particularly Domitian. And Domitian demanded that everyone worship him as a god. And that worked fine, except for the Christians. John was writing to his impoverished friends with a message from the Lord. It was a message of hope and encouragement for hard times because there was nobody who had been so damaged than the Christians in Smyrna. John's message of hope and encouragement for hard times is just as fresh for us today because there are many Christians around the world who have been damaged and the hope has been taken from them and they get no encouragement except from what they read in the Bible. These words and the letter itself clearly indicated that it wasn't John's words for them to hear, but the words of Christ. No, this came from the one who was first and last, who was dead and came to life. Interesting choice of words these folks must have thought. After all, their own hometown had done the same thing. It had been dead for 300 years, and now it was a live, thriving metropolis on the sea coast of the Mediterranean Sea, and it was called the crown jewel of Asia. Christ had experienced the worst and yet conquered it. The people of Christ there were in the morning were poor and downtrodden, and they must be hearing this message because that message brought life to them. It was an overwhelming and overcoming message for them to hear. And for that little group, it was just like a victory for their next meal. And somehow the Lord knew that. And so he said to them in this letter, I know of your affliction. I know of your poverty. And he was right. Things were so bad that a group of Christians that it felt like a great weight had been crushing down upon them ever since they started worshiping on Sunday morning. They were destitute. So overcome with the whelming sense of nobody was there to care for them? How about just for supper on the same day? But then something strange happened. The Lord in this letter called them rich. They lived in a rich city. They knew what rich meant, but they didn't see themselves as rich. In fact, that little group of Christians in Smyrna, the only church in the entire New Testament to be called rich, and yet they were the poorest of poor, obviously their riches were in things that money could not buy. So what could the Lord have meant for them? Was he saying that there was some virtue in poverty? Ah, yeah, rich people always think there's a virtue in poverty, but the poverty people don't see it that way. So I doubt if the Christians in Smyrna saw that they had the virtue of living in poverty. They were like you and me 
more than anything else. They had the idea of having a decent home and nice clothes and three square meals a day as much as anyone would want. They saw no virtue in poverty. Not many people still do. But apparently these folks were so poor that they had stopped worrying about where their next meal was coming from. Perhaps they took comfort in remembering that the Lord had said, look at the birds of the air and neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Surely they must have thought in their richness in poverty, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, neither toil nor spin, and yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. Maybe they considered the question, and maybe we should. Are you not worth more than the birds and the flowers? That little group of Christians knew that they were worth something because they had faith in a living and loving God who had promised to care for them and to deliver them from their powerful enemies. It is hard to imagine that such a raggedy little group of Christians would even have enemies. What threat could they be to anyone how could they look at those groups of Christians and think of them as enemies? On the other hand, evil always sees goodness as a threat. The Lord took note of the problem in his letter that morning. He mentioned one of the weapons their enemies had been using against the little group, slander. Their enemies accused the Christians of being non-believers in Roman culture, disloyal to Rome. Maybe, but it never said that. They just would not worship Domitian. They worshiped God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Enemies of the kingdom of God always use gossip and slander. It's their favorite thing. It puffs up their jealousy. So this letter to the church offered a word of comfort. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Beware the devil, of course meaning Rome, is about to throw some of you into prison that you will be tested and for 10 days you will have affliction. We may not see that as a comforting thought, but things are bad for them. But don't worry, they're going to get a lot worse. It was not much to look forward to but you see, imprisonment in those days was not just incarceration, it was generally a prelude to death. So if you were put into prison, there was no hope for you. And now here comes the word, the more of the group suffered together, worshiped together, and brought life to their small group. What was it the Lord said? Ten days? That was a normal metaphor back then for a short period of time as opposed to a thousand years. What were the Christians in Smyrna thinking as they read the letter? They had known what fear was like, the fear of starvation, the fear of exposure, the fear of persecution, the fear of too many enemies, the fear of slander, the fear of gossip, and yet they had survived all of that. And now of all the folks in Smyrna, these impoverished Christians had learned this. The fear itself is always worse 
than the things that you are afraid of. The fear itself is always worse than the things that you are afraid of. This is a pretty good lesson for anyone at any age, even today. But he had gone beyond that point. The life that these Christians in Smyrna were living this day was thorny. And somehow, something far better awaited them on the other side. That was truly good news for them. Finally, the letter was over. Now, there are millions of Americans who publicly call themselves Christians this morning. We are all gathered here to worship. Relatively few would resemble the group in Smyrna so long ago because we have money, we have power, we have influence, and we are safe. But as you go out of this place to your wonderful homes and your bountiful lunches, I would ask you to remember one thing. If those early Christians in Smyrna were magically transported to this day in this time, according to Jesus, their church would be the richest church in town. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Let us pray. Oh God, sometimes we are reluctant to confess that we are using the freedom and power and resources that we have for looking at life ourselves instead of sharing the gospel message to those who need to hear it way more than we do. We live in constant fear. We live and act out of our fear of scarcity, and yet we are blessed with your richness. We are blessed with your abundance and it is a gift. So forgive us the challenge that we consider ahead of us, the opportunities that we will make use of to share your glory, your peace, your forgiveness, and all of the love that you have given to us. We pray in your son's holy name. Amen. Amen. Let us stand and sing number 377 together. <laughs>